Tēnā koutou katoa, so Jordi McCallum, I'm from over the hill there in the mighty Wairarapa. Um, I work for a, an outfit called Wairarapa Property Consultants, um, where Philip Guscott and a couple of other guys have done various things from succession planning, um, farm management advice and a bit of valuation. Um, I myself did 14 years um, of rural banking. Um, which was nine more years than the initial five-year plan startup, but um, it gave me a heck of a lot of experience, situation, seeing a, a huge number of businesses and relating to a massive number of people. Um, but the time had come, so I um, jumped ship about four and a half years ago and joined Phil Guscott um, doing a fair bit of succession planning, um, worked with a number of, um, number of businesses, um, supporting their governance, their strategic planning, their budgeting, their finance, um, any sort of difficult situation that, that comes along is, um, is sort of, I'll, I'll give it a go anyway, but, but remembering sometimes um, you gotta, you got to stay within your expertise. Um, so that's a little bit about me today. We are talking about um, farm business succession and transition. Um, just as I look around the room, there's a few other sort of faces that I remember that. Richard Schofield, name used to be Dad when I knew him. Um, so yeah, farm business succession and transition. Um, and it will be, as William said, um, oh, I've got a few things that I'll talk through, um, but absolutely happy if, if I spark on something to throw a question at me. Probably won't delve into a personal situation if you go, I'm doing this, what do we do? Not sort of that sort of thing, but maybe if I'm heading a direction and you want to go a bit further down there, just throw, throw a question at me and we can sort of talk our way through it. Hopefully someone gets us some whiteboard markers and we can um, scribble on that at some stage. Go on their yep. way. Yep, we've got a thumbs up down there. Um, and Mark, you just said to me before, you want to do, Mark from Beef and Lamb wants to do a couple of interviews on anyone that is going through their succession process right now. Is that what you asked me? So at the end of today, if, um, if you've got a couple of minutes and keen, Mark is keen to, to quiz you a little bit on what you're up to. Cool? Right, succession. What is it? Um, what we call farm succession is sort of a cover up for, for quite a few things that are, that are happening um, in our lives and in our businesses. Succession itself, if you think about it, and, um, and I, I hadn't too much, but when you're going to talk on the topic, you, you do a bit of thinking. And if you think about royalty, someone succeeds the throne. They, they step up and they take over um, that person's um, assets, wealth sort of thing, and they take over their authority. So you're, you're succeeding that person in that way, which is a little bit of what we're doing. It's not quite as plain and simple as that, but but there definitely is a movement in the authority and the ownership of what we're up to. Transition, how far away are those, um, how far away are those markets? Might have been a couple of minutes. Um, we'll, jump, we'll come back to that one in a sec because I'm going to draw a little bit of a picture. Retirement, so yes we're talking about succession and working that, but um, if, you, if you jump over and pretend you're a, a normal person in town, normal person in town, um, that gets to the end of their working life and then retires, um, there's a whole lot of emotion and things getting wrapped up when you have done something for your whole life and you've earned a living and, and um, done all those sorts of things and then you come to the end of that journey and you're retiring. Now for farmers, retiring um, looks a whole lot of different ways and I think for everyone it does. It's not necessarily the um, start playing golf and. Um, read the paper and your slippers and that sort of thing. Farmers are a whole lot more active and hopefully within this process, um, retirement has still some sort of link and some sort of something to do from day to day. Um, but don't underestimate the, the emotional state of um, going from something that you've known your whole life and, and let's be honest with farms, it's, it's more than a job, it's more than a house, it's more than all those things. Um, it really is a part of you being the central part of that to suddenly being on the sideline is a pretty big, pretty big emotional challenge. Um, we'll jump back to that transition one. So a, transi a transition, and I call it, um, 
call it a business apprenticeship. I'll draw it up at the top so you guys down the back can see it. So, so effectively you show up day one on farm and um, the first, your, your first job, whatever it is, and the first thing you learn is the operations. How do we do, what do we have to do, how do we um, whistle a dog, dag a lamb, whatever it is. You do that for a little while to get your, get your basic skills up. Suddenly you start to see there's a few more things happening that you didn't realise while your head was down and your, your bum was up in the air, and you start to get into this management space. What's, um, what's sort of the next three months got in front of us? Um, what's, what's the numbers behind buying those bulls and selling those lambs there and all that sort of thing? And so you, you get into a space where you, you're growing your management capability and skill. Once you've done that for a little while and you've mastered that and it's second nature, you start to realise again, that's terrible writing, there's something else going on, there's a bit of strategy going on, a bit of governance. This business is going a direction, it's expanding, um, or it's trying something new like um, throwing some of Hadley's um, fine wool mix across to get a, a, a better return. So you're starting to think strategically, um, bigger than the farm. And then the last part across the side there is ownership. Now, you can, you can go overseas and do an OE and um, play around for a little while, then, then show up home when mum and dad give you the phone call, and pretty much the next day they could, they could transfer that ownership to you. That's probably the easiest part of the process, and it's a part of the process that gets focused on quite a bit. But really what, in a successful succession plan, we want to get a transition going and an apprenticeship going, so that you know the day that you sign the title over to the next generation or part of it or however however you do it, they understand how the business works, they've got the management skills to run the business, they've got the strategy and the mindset to run the business, they've built all th these things along the way, and so they are, they are good to go and, and ready to do it. You can trust them with the legacy and the assets and, and your income and, and all the other things that come with that succession plan. So that's why that, that transition is all important and while the next generation is heading up this way, the retiring generation is doing sort of the opposite. The first thing you stop doing is, is dagging the lambs and getting to the top of the hill. Then you start handing over um, the management, which a bit like if I had $50 in my hand right now and I said, here you go, I might be offering it to you but sometimes my fingers don't let go of the grip. Um, quite a hard one to let go of. Um, can be done in, in many sort of ways. You might um, you might appoint the manager. You might lease. They might buy the stock and lease for a period of time. All sorts of ways in the dairy industry for a long time. There's been a fantastic pathway we know, and especially still is to that management space. The contract milking. The, the really easy ways to give someone management expertise. Um, and then in the governance. Um, getting involved in their own business, maybe a lease block off to the side. Um, maybe your first step is that you go into equity partnership with them and you, you sort of discuss the strategy and bring them in. But all sorts of ways along the journey that you want to make sure that um, there's a, a good solid transition going on. Um, and then the last one down the bottom there, which is inheritance. Um, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a hard one, that one, and it's a bit bittersweet, and it's a shame that it's even a part of the whole thing because um, it only comes around with a, a sad story and a sad moment, but it is a part of it, and, it, and having that plan early is critical because um, everyone needs to know, know what's going to happen, so there's no surprises, and the last thing everyone wants, anyone wants is to open an envelope and, and get a surprise at that time, um, and that's where you get kicked back and you get problems. So. A good farm succession plan has an inheritance plan in there. People know what to expect. The rationale and everything um, has been well worked through. Um, so we're trying to, in a, in a, we call it farm succession, but we're managing a whole lot of really intense emotional things going on in there. Um, down the bottom there I've said, a good family farm business succession and transition plan transfers the management and the ownership of a business from one generation to the next while maintaining the relationships and enhancing the performance of the business. 
is that a pretty pretty big audacious goal to think you can pull all that off? How about do you think you can pull it all off by yourself? I don't reckon, but I charge people to invite me in, so I, I would say that. <laughs> um, so, a few critical parts of, of a good succession plan. First one, and absolutely the first one, is the people. If you don't manage the people in your family, the people in your business well, doesn't matter what the bottom line's doing, it doesn't matter what structure, prenuptial agreement, any sort of thing that you've got in place, if the people aren't understood and managed, then um, the thing has the chance of blowing to bits. And look, you might protect all your assets, you might do all that, but if you break down your family relationships, then you've lost a whole lot more um, than a family farm. You've, you've lost a family and you can keep the farm. So people, what have, what have we all got? We've all got needs that we bring to the table. Um, we've got needs as individuals, but we've also got needs as a group. So as a family group, there will be a set of needs that possibly, probably, um, and they may not have been said, but you all share together. There's a, a passion for a farm, and in some way, shape, or form, um, you'll all have a vision of what you what you hope will happen one day, and that, that might be for the ones that are on the farm, um, ones that are skating around in Australia or Europe or, or doing um, all sorts of other things. Um, we'll still have a story and a passion about that farm all the way back there, so we can't discount um, any one of your family members or stakeholders, however it works, and what, what their needs might be. Um, also have a few fears, and that's probably the one we talk about needs, but when you start having interesting situations um, with family members, often there's a fear or an insecurity in there which comes out in certain ways, aggression or the opposite of aggression, passive aggression, and you can't quite figure out Making sure you understand the people in your family is critical because you figure those things out. And sometimes when you understand why that person's behaving like that, because they were worried that this was gonna happen and they were gonna end up without this or without that. You know, my kids aren't gonna be able to go to the farm when when um, the brother or sister is entrenched in there and in the homestead and, and then, you know, where's my connection to the farm? <coughs> Understanding those things is critical so we can deal with them because we can, by and large, we can find ways to meet some of those intangible sorts of needs. Financial needs are easy to work out. Yes, we can accommodate that. No, we can't accommodate that. That's relatively easy to work out and easy to ration. I'll put counselling up there. Now, by the time I get involved, we've got sometimes 20 and 30 years of baggage. We've all got kids at different ages. I've got kids right now from nine to 15 and I'm building some baggage in those kids as we speak with the way I parent them and as I figure it out on the fly. Um, and then we come around the table and we think this is going to be a really uniform conversation all about the numbers. We've got to deal with a bit of that baggage and it might not be that you, you go to a clinical psychologist or a counsellor. My wife's graduating with a Masters of Counselling today down the road so I've got to get out of here at 2 o'clock. Um, so it's, it's a pretty useful person to have around. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's the self-awareness. And as, as I lead into a succession plan more and more, because I haven't always, it's about making sure people have had a bit of a think before they come to the table about themselves, about what they need, and there's a little bit of self-awareness there. Managing relationships. Throw me some ideas of, of some really important things about managing a good relationship. And don't be shy, we don't have much time. Mark's always got something. I'd say number one, communication. Communication, yeah. No assumptions, direct communication. Make sure people know what you're thinking, because they don't unless you say it. Perception versus reality. Perception versus reality, yeah. So making sure we take the time to understand people's perspective. Compassion. Yeah. Yep, so throw a business relationship and a family relationship in and it's very complex and, and can change. There's one back there somewhere. Uh, compassion. Compassion, yep. Brett? Understanding and 
appreciating what was going before. Yeah, understanding their perspective. Malcolm? Listening. Listening. There's one, I'll give it to you in a second, but there's one that I want to throw in there. Trust. Foundation of the relationship. And all those things work towards trust, but trust is really critical. Trust comes from doing what you say you will do, and it's really important keeping promises. And how many times you show up at a table and promises have been made along the lines of, it'll be okay, this is the plan, and that's all well and good, but sometimes you're not actually in a position to deliver on that promise, even if with all of your heart you want to. That's what you want to do. You promise it, 10 years down the track you go to do it, and it's not possible, or for whatever reason, you've been promising other things to other people, and we've all found ourselves in that place. Suddenly I got two people I made a promise to, and, and you find yourself in a whole lot of trouble. So absolutely building trust, focusing on that when you are in all life, but when you're dealing with this stuff, make sure the communication you give is accurate and you know what you're, what you're promising and make sure you can deliver on it. Um, we touched on it a bit there with um, with Robin's one as, as a family a family in business versus a family business. And it's um, the difference being a family business is a business and the people within it just happen to be family. Not, not coincidentally, but that's the way it is. A, a family in business, you're doing the business around the, around the breakfast table, on the fly here, over there. Um, you're not removing your family relationships from the business ones. Um, because is dad always the boss? His, his dad is the boss, but does that make him the boss on the farm? Not necessarily. Not <coughs> if, not if we're, we're transitioning and we've got a manager now and they're making decisions now. Hopefully that manager's not going to disregard experience and have a mentor, but dad's not the boss. And when you've got a family in business, sometimes um, dad's, dad might, dad's still dad, but it doesn't mean that, that he can sort of throw his weight around and, and tell so-and-so what to do. Um, and, and vice versa. It's not, not all a one-way street. Um, so building clear... Having a clear structure and understanding of your job roles and, and what it is you're meant to do. Um, and a re really important question being that if, it wasn't, if, if that wasn't your family member, would, would they be part of your business? Are they actually up to the job? Now, you might do it anyway, but it's important to know if they're not maybe the top fledging manager out there, either you need to get them there or you don't go and do that massive leveraged opportunity and put them under all sorts of pressure which which they're not capable of. Um, conflict. I won't, won't draw it. Um, let's let's just picture Brett Gould and the lawyers the lawyers team over here. Just before you get to them you get to um, the mediators and the arbitrators, the people that are in your shareholders agreements and all that stuff um, that are going to help you to, to resolve that conflict. Um, before you get to that, you might go to a trusted friend, a consultant, a, a trusted person to try and try and break it down. And way back over here, right at the start, um, there's an opportunity to talk things through yourselves. Not have an issue and bury it in the sand, but here's the starting point right here in conflict is something pops up, deal with it. And I'm terrible at this because I'm a, I avoid conflict. It's not my personality. Some people are really good at dealing with it right there they can piss you off at the moment, but out the other side you're always better off for talking about it here and now because every step you take gets more expensive, break down more relationship, and if Brett and his team have to get involved and um, you really are at the, you know, you've gone away from your goodwill and, and negotiating, you're having to go by the letter of the law. And the letter of the law often has two sides, doesn't it, Brett? not always quite black and white, it comes down to um, a whole lot of time, a whole lot of energy, a whole lot of money, you get a resolution, no one's happy. Deal with your conflict right back at the start. Um, so first critical, if I know you it's fine, no I don't know you, you'll be alright. 
Um, first critical one is the people. The second one is the business. So a profitable business is abs absolutely critical to a succession plan because we're going to be putting a, we're going to be um, requiring a lot out of that business in order to take care of all the all the affected stakeholders within it. Critical part of a, a business having a vision. What ultimately is the purpose of this business? What are we trying to create? Where are we going? Values. Who are we? What are we about? And that, that vision and those values is our why. That's why we wake up out of bed in the morning. If you're waking up at 4 o'clock versus 8 o'clock, the difference will be somewhere about how excited you are about that why and how sure you are about what you need to go and do in that day to achieve that, that long-term why. You then got to bring that back down to a strategy once you've got that vision and depending on where you're at, it could be a 30-year vision, it could be a 10-year vision, it could be a 5-year vision. You've got to bring it back down to what's your strategy to get there, how are you going to get there. Um, performance, I'm going to try something a little bit, little bit dangerous here. Jump into a bit of beef and lamb. Find my way around. I need to get the data, don't I? Data and tools. It's not actually on this one in front of me, so it's a bit bad. Is there a mouse up there? Anyone see a mouse? <laughs> no mouse. No, I should have brought up here. That's right. We'll, uh, we'll do the whiteboard. So I was going to show you how easy, oh you want to give that a crack, I was going to show you how easy it is to, um, <laughs> I've got a mouse, can you guys see that? Yeah, go data tools. How do you know if you've got a good business or not? Answers? How do you know? Measure it. On farm data, industry and production. Yeah, on farm data. You don't know you might be William? You're wearing, you're wearing the shirt. Uh, sorry. Uh, Mark the farm. Where do you fellas hang out? Northland, my hometown. Everyone knew all this information was online. Eh? Hands up, who's seen this before? Most, mostly. <coughs> oh, that's going to show up on another bloody no, screen, isn't it? somewhere which we can't see. is that quintile analysis and, and what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you the importance of um, the difference between a good business and, a, and sorry between between the bottom and the top and what it means to you what who thinks scale is important um, for succession. <laughs> Why doesn't my Tiki stay up here with me? <laughs> Come up here, Tiki. Ebit up. If you can zoom in on that one a little bit for us. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's there. Close, right. So on that EBITDA line, we got, we got eight lines, but five of them are the, the bottom farms to the top. Yep, scroll to your left a little bit. All the way to the left. Um, EBITDA, right up the top there. The bottom 20% are making $143 per hectare of earnings before interest, tax, and rent. Give them 1,000 hectares, and they'll make you $143,000. That is a plus A. The top end of the scale, which is this line here, that's right, bottom two, three, four, five. Um, is that $1,226 a hectare? Mm. We, oh, we're in the finish, it doesn't matter. We're in the, we're in the finishing farm. Give them a thousand hectares, they're gonna make you whatever those mats are. $1.2 million. Now, after you got that, before interest, tax, and rent, you've still gotta pay your interest. Most, if you go in places, you've got a mortgage. Um, you've still gotta pay your rent. You've still gotta pay your drawings. So these guys on the far left here are making no money, and there definitely isn't enough money to bring more labour in to, to let mum and dad go, so mum and dad are gonna keep, need to keep on working and cover that labour um, to break even. So you, you, you're going nowhere. Now if you benchmark and you find yourself in that place, don't be sad about it, because you've got opportunity. Because you know you only need to jump two clicks and you're up to 500. Look at that, 140 grand a year EBITDA. You're up to half a million. Suddenly you've got a little bit of money to work with. And way out on the um, right hand side here, you're up to 1.2 million. So understanding where your business is at, if it is taking you to your vision or not, is critical. Um, and it's not bad, don't be afraid of bad news because that's your opportunity. Had, it, had anyone used the beef and lamb data for um, for benchmarking purposes on their business? Yep, a few. Does that warm your soul, Mike? Sure. Mike goes and collects the data for you guys and plugs it in so we can we can check Mike? stuff out. There he is. Yeah. So it is real, real, real farms. Yeah, real farms. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And all free information, all online. Um, I just need to all use it. Yeah, goes across there, yeah. Um, the critical part to me is, is in most of these ones I do, and they got it all over the, all over the countryside. Um, normally when I do it, and this is, we've jumped on intensive farms, and I don't want to go and play around and get the other ones. Normally you've got to get up to those top two columns before you create a surplus out the bottom after a normal mortgage and a normal drawing rate and all those sorts of things. So. We're talking about 40% of sheep and beef farmers making an actual surplus and progress year on year. So I can tell you for free, before you invite me to your house, that if that's your business and you're trying to do the succession tomorrow, it won't work. If you're trying to do it in five or 10 years, you've got a chance, but it's gonna take some changes in the way you do things and, um, and a little bit of um, honesty, hard work to, to get yourself there. 12, there you go, fast. Right, apprenticeship will cover it off, so that's, that's just working that next generation through your business, working your way out, impact of succession, um, and we played around with a few of these numbers yesterday. If you need um, $100,000 net to live off, you're gonna, need, um, you're gonna need to be leaving in a chunk of capital, what's $2 million at 5% will give you 100,000 gross, and once you hit 65, you'll get a little bit of super. Let's say that gets you up to 100,000 net. The business you're leaving behind, let's say they, they pay that to you, they're gonna be effectively servicing a couple of million dollars worth of debt um, to take care of you. You're gonna need somewhere between half a million dollars and a million dollars to come out um, to sort out a house. You might say, oh, we've got a house, we built, one, um, we built one five years ago on the farm. Well, that probably cost you half a million to a million dollars to do that, so you're already servicing that debt which will, which will stay with the farm and then you're going to need a bit of a nest egg because you don't want to be going back to the farm um, to say oh shit the car's just broken broken down we need a new one and we, we drive V-dubs rather than um, great walls so it'll be 80 grand and not 24 grand 
you don't want to be you don't want to be doing that. We need to set this up so that you are self-sufficient because you've built this, and if a succession plan can't deliver um, a retirement to the retiring generation, then we don't have a succession plan. So you need to understand what your specific needs are. But in short, we've got hundred thousand dollars net um, of income, which is about a couple of million bucks worth of, of capital left in. We've got a million bucks to come out for a house, and we've got another two, three, four hundred thousand to, to have off to the side. So when you've got one offs, health issues, those sorts of things that need to be dealt with, they can be dealt with. So the impact of succession is significant. Your business, if you if you're holding the line now, is not going to be able to go through succession and continue to hold the line. You need to be making some progress in order to, to make that work. Um, day one, you might just move the deck chairs, and it might be the same business, and that's fine. Um, but eventually your labour component will reduce and you will still need your income um, to live off and, and more labour needs to come in. Contribution down the bottom, if you're coming home, um, if you are looking to um, re-enter the, the family business, whatever you bring and contribute, um, be it that you are, are bloody awesome at your job and you can lift performance and bring that, that's important, all the way through to bringing a couple of hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, whatever it is you bring in, um, all the better, all the stronger for that, that succession plan and that business. Process. So the process is pretty organic in, in real terms. Um, when, when you start going through it, your situations um, have different different aspects, different challenges. So this is pretty general, but first thing you need to do is establish the end game. Whose is the succession plan? Who um, who is it? Whose is the succession plan? Mum and dads? Mum and dads, that's right. Mum and dad are in the seat and in, in um, intergenerational businesses. They are currently in that, let's call it the throne to keep it easy. They have that authority, they also have that responsibility on their shoulders. Now we absolutely want to include everyone in the process, but we're not including everyone in, in a democracy around the Knights of the Round Table. We're including everyone in the communication, but ultimately mum and dad have carried it to that point. It is their values, their understanding of their family, which, which sets the ultimate outcome. It doesn't mean you work all that out and then go tell your family because that that leaves a few things out, um, a little bit of time for them to work through it um, and secondly they might tell you some things through the process that are going to enhance your understanding of them, of the business and what the best, the best way to go is. Um, but you do have that responsibility, it's yours and you need to, you need to lead the process. What you're handing on in, a, in an intergenerational business is not um, not just a complicated business to run, but a legacy. Somewhere along the line, there is the chance that that this farm, this business could be sold. And at that point in time, let's just hope that that is the right decision, all things being equal. A lot of people that I talk to now, the first thing they say is, we love our family to, to take it forward, but there's no obligation. Because the last thing we want is an obligation and people go into it for the wrong reasons and it's not going to stand the test of time. Um, for those ones that do come on, they will, maybe not day one, but over a period of time, everyone will wake up one day and, and they will be genuinely in that throne. They will have that authority. They will have taken that weight. And that is an intangible thing that's going on to carry that legacy. And if one day they have to make that call to sell because it's the right thing to do, that's a responsibility that, that they'll have to carry. And that's it's this whole fear versus equal conversation, but that that kind of um, that kind of mindset just needs to be understood. And it's not to say that you that you can't still aim for equal, but if your business can't manage equal, you need to then make a call about how much you are valuing some of those intangible aspects of an intergenerational farm, um, keeping the farm and the family and, and all those sorts of things. Five minutes, right? Um, so you, you need that end game. Start with yourself, get the end game. What will your business allow you to do? We've just 
just been through how you can do that um, in terms of benchmarking, in terms of your bank managers, your consultants, your accountants, people around you um, that you trust to help you to, to work out that one. Um, then, you, then you engage the family and it's important, um, there's no rules for it in terms of you do it all first or you do it one by one, but you engage the family in the way that you, you think is best um, and you're really framing up that big picture. Here's what we're seeing, here's the state of our business, you might not go right down to detail, but here's the sort of state of the business and inviting them to bring to the table what, what's their relationship to the business, what's the future that they see, what are some of their needs, um, and try and understand those sorts of things. Um, hands up who's going to do all that by themselves. A couple of you. Um, and look, it is okay. People, I've showed up at sometimes with people that have done it themselves and have done a, a, a really good job, but it's like anything. The people that can do it probably make it harder for the rest of us because you think, oh, you can do it, but they've got some special sort of, they, that's their skill set, perhaps. Whereas for a lot of us, let's recognise our skill set, whether it be the farming part, the financial part, the, the crazy strategy and grow the wealth like crazy part, and let's stick to what we're good at, and when we get into managing complex relationships and trying to deal with family on a business level, not a family level, um, let's get the right people involved to, to make sure that, that that gets done well. Um, then we start considering options. So once you know where you're going, what you're trying to do, who's on board, who, who, how it's going to go, you start looking at your different options. And that's with that apprenticeship, you can start leasing, you can start um, looking at a, a long-term company equity partnership, all those sorts of um, different ways of doing it. Do you need to expand? Um, do you need to start getting assets outside of the farm? And all those different things to take care of the, the needs of all the different parties. Um, then you start to get to a draft plan stage and then you sort of know where you're going and how it's going, it's coming down to just tweaking from there. Um, you roll that back through the family and, and it's trial and error. Like I said, you roll it through the family, you're communicating all the time. Their feedback does not mean that you do or don't do those things. It's just, and it's important that you frame that properly because ultimately you do need to make that call. Um, if you're bringing someone into the business, they also need to make their call from their side that it fits their family, their values, their needs, and what, what they're trying to achieve. Um, point six down there, the last one, once you've got the people sorted, the business sorted, what you, wanna, um, what you want it to look like, then you can start to wrap a structure around it that supports all those things. Not The first thing most people ask is, oh, so are companies or trusts or da-da-da better? No one of them is any better or worse than the other. You just want to make sure what you use is fit for purpose um, for your plan and your business. Um, down the bottom of my page, not yours, I just noted a whole lot of, of other things that be under the heading legal. As you go through this process, you need to keep your legal position and documentation updated with where your intentions and your headspace is at. Um, your wills, memorandum of wishes for your trustees, powers of attorney um, in terms of your standard one, your enduring one, and the medical one, the one who, the person who's going to manage the switch when you're asleep on that hospital bed, um, all critical parts that you need to do. Um, succession plans can be tied together with a family deed of arrangement, so if you manage it well and you get to the end and everyone's on board, everyone can sign away to say, we agree to that, we waive our rights to, um, to argue with that, dispute that in the future. Um, insurance, making sure that you've got insurance in the right places on the right people so you don't get caught out. My second to last slide, am I out of time? No, it's about a minute. minute. Last, one's, last one's just the summary. Success, what, is it, what does success look like? A good succession plan is just a good strategic plan. Doesn't matter if it's a 30 year one or a five year one. Um, to me, succession plan is just a, it's a fad at the moment because we're doing a bit of catch up. A lot of the people that are taking on the businesses are starting with the end in mind, just because of the process that they've, they've gone through to get there. Leadership, like I said, um, retiring generation, people in the throne, you must lead the process. Values, make sure you understand um, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, communication. Absolutely, you can't, people um, don't know what you think, 
um, and you want to give a good, safe environment to have those conversations. Get the right expertise involved, um, and then the transaction is all about executing it and making it happen as per the plan. Done. Cool. Done. One question, maybe. One question, anyone? 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 Cody, you said you haven't mentioned the siblings, the other brothers and sisters in the family. Now, they have to be looked after too. You cannot just look after the one family. Have you mentioned that? Well, I've talked as a family inclusively because I, the minute I say someone, the farming member of the family, different. I've got succession plans at the moment which have one farmer, two farmers, and three farmers all going at it. So to me, I put them all, put them all in the same boat. You're all family, and when I'm saying they're coming to the table with their needs, the non-farming members are coming with their needs, which is a connection to the farm. Um, What's their view of a fair distribution of capital? Do they understand it? If the, it is the case that there's going to be more left in farm, um, absolutely, there's got to be something in it for the non-farming members of the family, um, and they've got to be okay with that. So the three kids can't be third or third or It's all your business dependent. I've got one at the moment, which the plan is third, third, third. We got we got one off farm. We got one at um, management level, we got one that's gone 50 50 equity partnership. So they're all at different ages and stages. The goal is that all three of them will end up with a farm. And we're going to wrap it up there. <laughs> today was always only going to be a taster because you can't do this all in one hour. So, so thanks very much, Jordy. Jordy and his business are only a Google away. Um, so, so do that. I do notice that there are a bunch of other industry associates in the in the room too. So talk to the people over Smoko, and um, and that's right. And if you would like to hear more on the subject, and look around for a farmer counselor and tell them that we need to cover this off in a workshop or a field day in our neck of the woods. The farmer counselors are those of us with these great jerseys on. So I'll finish up there because there's people outside. Thank you very much, Jordy, for your time. I wish you all the best in the ceremony. I love this, I appreciate it.